Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious. It's tea and crumpets time in the afternoon here with Mr. John Tribe, legendary British engineer. Mr. Tribe, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Mark. Thank you. Very well, well, good. Uh, my privilege to have known this gentleman uh, with some of the other supporters of our museum, like John has been. I'm sure for almost all 20 years has been here. You're going to enjoy his stories we've got to tell. How you been lately? I've been good. Getting good. old. Getting old? Getting old, but uh, luckily the mind's still functioning, mm -hmm. you know, so that's about all I can hope for, I guess. Well, we had lunch together with a couple other your friends, <laughs> including Mr. Jay Honeycutt and uh, Lisa Malone and others there. It's always good to get together, and, and uh, you guys always have a lot to talk about. Indeed we do. Indeed, Indeed we do. We do. Yep. When we get to our age, that's all we do is talk about <laughs> the days gone by. Well, you look good. You look great. Folks, you're going to hear an amazing story from Mr. John Tribe. His unique Apollo story begins as a young boy with his family being bombed in England by, by the German technology that 18 years later you were utilizing to send America to the moon. That's correct. So let's kick it off with that. John, you're going to tell us about growing up. Where, where were you born? And... Okay, I, I was born in uh, in Portsmouth in England. Uh, this was before World War II because, uh, you know, the war, the war in England started in two years before Pearl Harbor. A lot of Americans don't realize that. We, we were going through some bad times in 1939, and one of the biggest concerns that the, the British government had at that time in the start of the war was that the Germans were going to gas the civil population. So the, one of the first things they did was uh, issue gas masks to yeah. everybody. And here's uh, this is a, a picture I've, I remember very well. This is uh, this is the way we looked back in those days when we put our gas masks on, and all us kids had uh, little cardboard boxes. You can see the boxes there. Yeah. And we carried that gas mask around with us everywhere we went. Wow. Well, as it turned, as the war progressed, it was pretty obvious that wasn't going to happen, and the gas mask got tossed into a closet. But, but that was one of the first memories I have of World War II was, was hauling that gas mask around. Marky, Marty circled John's home there. We're looking at, of course, the UK and, and above it, Scotland. And, and hello there to Robert Laws up in Dundee, Scotland, watching okay. today. And Ireland, the big island there to the left. That's okay. your hometown. The hometown huh? is Portsmouth. It's right across from the Isle of Wight, right at right the, the tip of the, the arrow there. Uh, as such, it was, it was a naval city. And uh, it was the premier naval city in, in, in Britain, so it was a prime bombing target for the, uh -huh. for the war. And John's going to share a few pictures and, of that here. Let's look at this next one here. And uh, uh, initially we were uh, evacuated, you know, in, in the start, at the start of the war again, they evacuated all the civil population, young kids, out of the main targets. So my mother and my sister and I were uh, routed off to, uh, to Winchester, which was about 30 miles away. And we could stand outside the house we were boarding in and literally see the bombing of Portsmouth in, hmm. the, dist in the distance by the light in the sky. Hmm. So that, that, I remember that also. Uh, we got back to Portsmouth after the, uh, after the, the heaviest of the Blitz in 1940 finished. Uh, we went back and I remember going to school and, uh, and we, had those, uh, we had a barrage balloon in the, in the playground of the school. Put the yeah, well, but, uh, we were looking at these images of yeah, the uh, dirigibles. That, that that is a huge balloon. Uh, it was uh, filled with hydrogen, and it was it was right in the schoolyard. So we would go out there, and I would just just watch these guys, you know, playing around with tanks of hydrogen, filling these balloons, and they would uh, put it up. Uh, I think between five hundred and a thousand feet, and they, of course the purpose was is to pre preclude uh, the Germans from. Uh, low-level low attacks. So they couldn't use so, their machine guns. Uh, right. You know, they, we had the balloons in the playground. We had huge water tanks installed in all the roads. Uh, shelters were built in the roads. And, uh, and you had these shelters. And these your... shelters, This the civilian population was given an opportunity to put a shelter in their own backyard. And this is what we called an Anderson shelter. And it's galvanized iron. Uh, you dig a hole, you, you put in all the pieces put bunks inside it, and then you cover it with dirt. And my grandfather planted marigolds all over the top of this, this shelter. And today, if I smell damp earth and marigolds, I'm taken back 
in 1941. Sleeping in something Sleep, like that. Sleeping. You were eight years old, John? or I was about six at the time. Wow. And I remember, you know, that the siren would go off. My mother would grab me out of bed and we'd run down the street to my grandmother's. My grandmother had one of these shelters. We didn't have one in our, our garden. And, uh, and I, as we ran down the street, everything was breaking loose all around me. There was a rocket battery just behind our houses that was firing rockets one after the other, screaming. There were flares dropping, there was stuff clinking down in the road, you know, little mm. pieces of shrapnel. And we'd be running down the road and my mother had, had steel tips on her shoes. And uh, and it would become clip, 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 clip. And I'd say, quiet, quiet, quiet. <laughs> really? they, they'll hear us. <laughs> and, uh, huh. and and we'd go down and, shoot, and they'd toss me in there with the rest of the family that'd be, be in that bunk. Everybody get in there for if there was a, uh, if there was, if the bombing got close, except my uncle Jim, he would always stand outside. He wouldn't get in. Uh-huh. And then uh we're gonna look at another we'll talk about we'll talk that. About talk about your yeah, dad here. Yeah, my dad was uh, my sure both does. my brother and my dad were serving in the navy at the start of the war. That's your dad in the upper right hand corner. That, that's there. my dad with the beard. My my brother was uh eighteen years older than me, so he'd already been in the navy before I was born. <laughs> so they were both serving and uh, this was nineteen forty two and I was sitting in the living room with my mother and uh, she was listening to the one o'clock news. It was a Sunday, I remember, vividly, really. And uh, on the, the uh, announcer on the one o'clock news said HMS Eagle had been sunk in the in the Mediterranean. That was a sh that's the aircraft carrier in that picture there. That's the ship he was on. Uh, he was uh, he was on the pedestal convoy. I don't know if you know about them. You know they were trying to relieve Malta. Malta was in big trouble. You know the Germans and the Italians had bombed the crap out of Malta. And there was virtually no fuel left and no no aircraft. And this was a very big convoy to Malta, to, from Gibraltar to Malta, to try and save the day. And the first ship sank was that that carrier. Huh. Four torpedoes in a right along one side. Went down in eight minutes. I think a lot a lot of crew were lost. But uh, you know, of course, my mother was hysterical. She was screaming, and neighbors were coming in. There was chaos, you know. But it was very traumatic for a little boy because I didn't, you know, I'm not trying to totally understand it, what was going on but it was uh it was a, about i think four days i think before he got a telegram out of Gibraltar to say that he'd been picked up wow and he was coming home what and kind of stories did your father tell you about it, that experience it, it, he never he, he in later years much later years he would he, he would draw me pictures of where he was at the time the torpedoes hit and how he got up to the deck and how he got down the deck and got his life jacket on he said the bad part was in the water because the destroyers moved in and started depth charging the submarine mm. and they were depth charging the, the people in the water too he said you know it's really bad he swallowed a lot of fuel oil Ooh. and uh and so he it was not a pleasant experience but uh, for years afterwards he would suddenly say uh, to, to my mother man she said whatever happened to that pen of mine or this or that and then he'd say oh it's on the eagle <laughs> you, know, you know, you lose everything, of course, in a situation like that that you had with you. Uh, but anyway, that was another traumatic wartime experience. I don't really want to dwell on, on war. Right. But, but uh, it, we, we did get a lot. This is Portsmouth, uh, a view of Portsmouth. That's a, you're probably looking at about a three-mile by three-mile uh, section of Portsmouth there. And every one of those black dots is a bombing raid. Hmm. So you can, you can see in the yellow area on the, on the, on the left is the dockyard. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the red there. That is incendiaries. You know, they were trying to burn the dockyard. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the, right at the very top left, where you see a little island out to the left. Of the, yes. That's, that's called Whale Island. That's where my dad worked most of his life. Huh. But the little black dot to the right of that, uh, yeah. the highest one, that's where I lived. Oh, really? And that's, that in 1944 was where the V1 came down. And again, I, my, my father had been shipped to Glasgow and uh, he'd taken my mother and me with him. My sister was still there. Mm -hmm. They were all in that shelter, the Anderson shelter, when that bomb fell six houses away. My gosh. And my Uncle Jim was outside. Here we go. I think we can see a picture of the street here, right? Yes, go ahead. Uh, there's the uh, V. That's, that's the V1, of course. Yeah. And that, they, we called them buzz bombs back in those days. A buzz bomb because it made a kind of a buzzing noise. Yes. It wasn't like a regular internal right. combustion engine. And that is the road 
And in fact, the two guys, or the, well, the guy that's facing you, that's carrying the furniture out of the house so on the on the right, is yeah. my, my uncle Tom. Your uncle's carrying that piece, that yep. bureau was there, right yep. there. Wow, right, right there. And to the right, the lady standing to the right of him uh, is my aunt Gladys. Uh -huh. And my grandmother's house is right there. It was it was destroyed. It, you know, it's still standing, but it was uh, it was structurally totally unsafe. You can see how close the bomb was. Yes. It's actually in the backyard of the houses that have destroyed farther down the road. We lived about a dozen houses to the right. Uh -huh. We lost our roof, all the windows. And uh, what we did for the next, oh, I don't know, three months, I think, every night we'd catch the bus and go up to the hill that was overlooking Portsmouth. And if you go go ahead, yeah, I think uh, we'll see. Well, let, let, first of all, let's show the, uh, that, that that's what an Anderson shelter looks like after a bombing raid. <clears throat> no so, marigolds on it. No marigolds, but but hanging in there. It, it, it saved lives. See, look, it did. It did. And... Uh... Now, this is the hill I was telling you about. This is the hill overlooking Portsmouth. And you see that little black mm -hmm. hole at the bottom? The opening. That's the entrance. And, and inside of that? And inside of that were bunks. And that's where we slept for three months. We three were, months. We were 1941, the bus. we're talking. 1944. 44, talking, okay. Yeah. We would go up there, and I can remember sitting on the edge of the bunk and my sister bringing me a cup of, ch cup of cocoa. Huh. Was it illuminated pretty well? Or that's time exposure photo, probably. That looks better than I remember. Yeah. It was kind of gloomy. Like yeah, I, I bet remember. it was yep. in there. And, and uh, uh, anyway, that's, you know, these, these are all experiences in the war. So I, I grew up and, and but I, I always had a kind of an interest in aviation. And uh, when I was at the, at my high school, uh, I, I, I was awarded a scholarship by the Royal Air Force. And uh, they taught me how to fly. And that, that right. picture there is... It's actually uh, me and my tiger moth at the top there, the little old biplane. Look at that, Marty. What a biplane. And one of those is over in Titusville, by the way, in the Valiant Air Museum. Is it really? They have one just like I'll that. go yeah. check that out, John. They're good and friends it, of ours. At the and underneath it is my Valiant flying Air license. Uh, you know, I, I was 17 when I got my flying huh. license, which was four years before I got a driving license. Wow, really? Did you continue doing that when you no, came to No, I couldn't afford States? it. Couldn't afford it. Yeah. Uh, flying was expensive and I had no money. But that, the way I put that flying license up there is that if you look at the words, I don't know if you can read them or not, but it says flying machine. Yeah, flying machine. Fly, yeah, I noticed that on there. Flying machine, not you know, an that, airplane. That, that sounds like something out of 1903. Yes, you know, a not, flying not, machine not, there. Yeah. A tiger moth. That's cool. Yep. And then finally we get you near a rocket. And uh, and then I after... Uh, after grammar school or high school, I went on to, uh, I, I was destined to go into Royal Air Force. That was all I was planning to do. There was the no, Royal no Air question. Force. And that's why I got the Scott Lyons scholarship. They gave it to me because I was potentially going to be a, a, an officer at go to Cranwell in the, the Air Force Academy. And uh, I failed the medical. Hmm. And I had a bit of a cold and my eustachian tubes were plugged up and hmm. the doctor failed me and there was no appeal. Hmm. And I was absolutely shouting, I didn't know what to do. You know, it was, oh, you know my whole career has just stopped. So uh, the, I went to the agency locally there, and they said, well, why don't you think about going to de Havilland, work for an aircraft company? Said, okay, you know, I wasn't real enthused, but, but de Havilland's offered me an apprenticeship, five-year apprenticeship. They would, uh, and, uh, and at the same time, they would send me to university on a part-time basis to get a degree. So I did that. And it worked out amazingly. You know, I got a lot of hands-on experience. We were building the, the vampires, the venoms, the sea vixens. But then de Havilland's was a big company. De Havilland, one of the premier companies they in were, Europe at the they, time. Right? At the, in 1954, they were building the Comet for the world, you know, the first jet airliner. Yes, okay. And the same, no sooner did I join de Havilland's than they had the crashes because of the uh, structural failures of the Comet. Mm. And they went into full decline, which <laughs> was poor timing on my part. But uh, 1957, I remember standing outside the house I was living in in Bournemouth, watching Sputnik fly over, or watching the, it was actually the third stage of Sputnik. But yes, it was. No the one way. ever saw Sputnik. It was no, too nobody small. Nobody ever saw Sputnik. We saw the, third, the second stage. But you watched this stage, light go yeah. over, and, and, there's a, and a little light went off in my head then. I thought, hmm, that, you know, there's, there's a future here, space. Really? So de Havilland's had a, another division that was uh, just concerned with rockets. And uh, they were building the Blue Streak rocket very secretly, but we knew of it. 
And Blue Streak is nothing more or less than a two-engine Atlas. And they built the Atlas, and you, you saw the picture there. Yeah, picture I think. of the Blue Streak yeah, here. That, that's the Blue Streak being erected at Spade Adam. And there's the, the launch, first launch of the Blue Streak, which was some years later. I think that launch is where at? In Woomera, Australia. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, I switched divisions at the, when I got my apprenticeship and, uh, and I had my degree. So I went up into the space division and, and uh, we were working on Woomera, uh, working on the Blue Streak when they canceled the program. Hmm. And, uh, and that was 1960. And at that time, I was, I was reading a Flight International magazine and there was an article in there about, about the Cape. And the guy that wrote it started off by saying, Notwithstanding the lonely pelican winging his way down the Indian River, the Cape is a busy place. And I thought, hmm, that sounds like a neat place to work. Because, uh, you know, this, this, the, pro, the Blue Streak, they put it into a European launcher category, and it was going to be slow as molasses in terms of getting anywhere. And I was young and anxious and, and impatient. So I wrote over here to uh, Convair, to General Dynamics, and B.G. McNabb, was the base manager of the uh, the General Dynamics group at, K at uh, the Cape, mm -hmm. and they you know they had five launch sites, 11, 12, 13, 14, and thirty six, and and Mac took me under his wing and wrote me a long letter back. This is what you got to do. And, you know I had to get up go up to the embassy and I had to get visas and I had to get him have a medical, and I failed the medical again. They said I had TB. Oh. And I said I don't have TB. Well, you need to prove it. I had to prove that I didn't have it. And I did, finally. <laughs> and showed up over here. I landed in Cocoa Beach with a dollar in my pocket. A and dollar? A dollar. No no car. I was in the Holiday Inn. The company was putting me up. And, I got, and uh, Max says, come on down to the bank Monday. And he, at that time, he was a director of the Cocoa Beach State Bank, which is long gone. But they went there. They gave me a $2,000 loan with absolutely no credit rating whatsoever. Hmm. That's twenty thousand dollars back in that and, day. And uh, well, enough to buy a car and and put a down payment on a on, on you know rental on a on a, an apartment. My wife didn't come with me. Mm -hmm. I got married. That was six. I've been married six months at this time. Mm -hmm. So these these were uh, tough days. I was homesick, but uh, I couldn't go work on the Cape because I had to get a security clearance, and I couldn't get the security clearance until they processed my application for citizenship. So it took uh, like six months before I finally got out to the Cape and I got onto Complex 12 and it, it took off after that. Hmm. I said, okay, you're a propulsion engineer. I said, I am, okay. okay. <laughs> what do I have to do? And uh, and if, if you... Uh, Things seem to work out fine after look, that. Look at the next, next picture. We're enjoying saying. this conversation with Mr. John Tribe. Hope you are too. He's uh, been a great asset to this museum over the years and uh, just... Uh, his stories are unbelievable. Had a lot to do with the shuttle program also. But we're just going to talk about Apollo today, John. Yeah, right. And uh, there's your blue streak going up in the sky. There's a familiar uh, there's guy the, in sunglasses. That's the chap I was telling you about that got me over here. And I owe the fact that I'm sitting here today. What's his name again? B.G. McNabb. B.G. McNabb. And you'll find a lot of the old Convair guys around here will all know him. That's he, right. He's a character. Uh, the old uh, and, and uh, there the, in that picture, of course, you'll recognize John Glenn. John Glenn, there signing, signing either uh, something yep. on his back or or signing yep. his back there. Yep. And that was the uh, that was our group on Complex Twelve, the engineering team. You're and, right above my head there, right there is John Tribe with the glasses. There. And, uh, and, and, and two, they, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty. About thirty, thirty men there. Huh? But, and plus, plus, we had a big uh, group of technicians and inspectors. This was the engineering crew. This was basically the blockhouse crew. And we know the legend. Mm -hmm. We know the history of all this and oh, so yeah. forth. Yeah. There probably wasn't a woman's bathroom nearby anywhere, huh? No, there was a lady on the on the pad. Uh, Millie Hagen was okay. there, and she used to make ceramic mugs for everybody. And I used to do all the artwork on them. We, oh, really? But, but, well, yeah, I'm glad it brought nice up lady. that memory. That's yep. a good one there. And okay, so then uh, in, in 1964, I went back to England. Uh, you know, we came over essentially for my wife and I for two years. That was the intent. And then to go back and pick up with the Blue Street program. Well, those we stayed almost four years. And in that time, I worked on the Mercury program. I worked on John Glenn's launch. I worked on the first Ranger that hit the moon. I worked on the first Mariner that went to Venus. 
worked on the first Centaur launch. You know, it was incredible uh, activity and exciting. And, and I had a lot of responsibility. Uh, I was teaching a lot of the Air Force at the same time, and it was, it was great years. And, but I committed to go back, so we went back. And McNabb, before I went back, he said, I'll bet you $5 to an English pound. He said, you'll be back. So I took the bet, and I wrote to him about three weeks later, and I said, here's your, here's your pound. <laughs> I said, get me back. And uh, I got back to England, and the weather was crappy. We had trouble buying a house. Uh, the job was dead in the water. And I said, this is ridiculous. I'm going back. The sunny pelicans. And so I came back. Florida. And by that time, Convair was starting to fold up on the Atlas program. So they said, you know, we don't have any openings right now, but we've given your paperwork to North American Aviation. Uh, Apollo was building up. So they made me an offer, and, uh, and I went over, and I, I, my first job was... Again, propulsion, you know, the reaction control system, responsible engineer for the Apollo space group. So, mm. Great. And uh, so that's really what I wanted to talk about was, uh, okay, was, was the Apollo program and the hypergoal world. Uh, you, you know, everybody knows, we've all seen the photos of all the Saturn V's lifting off with a tremendous five F1 engines going full bore with one and a half million pounds of thrust. And then you've got the S2 with five J, uh, J2s and then the S4B with another J2. Those 11 engines are all anybody ever knows about on Apollo. I want to tell you that above those 11 engines was 55 more engines in the command module, the service module and the lunar module and the S4B app system. And, uh, and those 55 engines uh are basically if, if, if you look let's uh, let's look at the next picture yeah we've got the uh we're looking at the command module okay so there you'll see in the uh the command and service module on the command module which is the cone shaped uh, capsule on the right there are 12 thrusters and those 12 thrusters play a highly important role of of uh position in the command module for re-entry if you don't if you don't obviously if you don't position it correctly it's either going to skip off or or burn up so critical engines basically two systems of, of a total of 12 thrusters on the service module below which is they have 16 thrusters and they're in four quads equally spaced around the service module and there's four engines on each one of those quads each engine has about a hundred pound thrust and that's what the CSM uses for attitude control in space. Now, all these engines, all 55 engines that I was talking about on the top end of the vehicle are hypergoal engines. And, uh, you know, there's a, most people, a lot of people know what hypergoal means, but for those that don't, hypergoal propellants are storable. They're not like cryogenics that have to be in a vacuum jacketed or insulated container. They are storable, so as such, they're very, uh, very much preferred for in-space operations. Plus, they don't need an ignition system. They ignite themselves. You mix the two propellants, they'll, they'll burn. So, uh, you know, an igniter system is inherently uh, not always reliable. So, mm -hmm. again, hypers for a deep space mission are much preferred, and that's why just about every spacecraft we've ever flown has a hyper system mm -hmm. on it. So the RCS is just like all, all, all these were hypers and uh, the RCS, the command module and the service module used nitrogen tetroxide for the oxidizer, monomethylhydrazine for the fuel. The SBS, the big engine on the left, which I was not responsible for at that time, I, I became later on, but that used aerosene 50 for a fuel, which is a mixture of uh, hydrazine and uh, and unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine so you know that was a particular aerosene uh, aerojet proprietary fuel and uh and then the, the lunar module underneath yeah we're gonna john you're gonna take us a little more in depth there well i can yeah that's that's just showing you the the four quads on the service module this was what i was responsible for initially and you can see the uh, how many tanks there are wow you know, it's it's not just one big fuel tank and one big oxidizer tank. You have 16 Two. tanks. Hmm. And each one of those tanks has to be loaded separately. Some tanks are horizontal, some tanks are vertical. The vertical tanks you could load over 
fill and then drain back an ullage. A horizontal tank, you had to pull a vacuum on mm -hmm. because every one of those tanks had a bladder inside it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the only way a thruster will work in, in the vacuum of space is if the, and, and when you've got a zero G condition, you've got to compress that bladder to push the propellant out of the thrusters. You can't afford to keep be pushing air or helium down into the thrusters. They would be all over the place. Okay. So every one of those tanks has a bladder in it. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, what happens when you bust the bladder. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the tanks uh, bigger than a watermelon, four feet, they look like? Not a whole lot bigger than a watermelon. Okay. They're, you know, they're, they're about this long. A yard, maybe. Some... About that big okay. around. They, to get all of them in there, and everyone yep. kind of gets an idea how big the service module and is. So right? actually, uh, uh, there were 30, I think it was 36 tanks total. It top. had to be filled up. It had to be filled, and they uh, they had to be filled, uh, in, for the most part, individually. You know, mm -hmm. you, and and the one of the the, the uh, problems that happened on the Apollo program, you know, we were always worried about weight on the spacecraft. Weight was a driver from day one, and uh, one of the weight reduction drives decided to eliminate a whole bunch of instrumentation in the vehicle. So anything that was in the way of pressures or temperatures that we needed on the ground uh, that was on the vehicle and not needed in flight, they took out. They mm. said, okay, you know, if you if, if you ground guys want to know what it is, you figure out how to get it. We're not going to carry that weight all the way to the moon and back. So a lot of the instrumentation that we relied on to load wasn't there anymore. Mm. And that made it even more complicated. Mm. So Interesting. Uh, because he's got a story to tell about Apollo 16, the next yeah, to the last one. Maybe yeah, we'll, that, we'll get to that. Maybe that some, played into that there. There's some other pictures of the quads. And, uh, Give you an idea of the complexity of it, how John what, had to be what responsible did, for all that. They, uh, they, they sent us the first, the Airframe 1 Quad D. They sent that down in 1965, and uh, they gave it to me and said, okay, go check it out, write all the procedures, and load it and fire it. I said, oh, okay, that sounds like fun. So uh, there were two of us, myself and Larry Whitaker, and, and we had that quad. And we also had another piece of hardware called an FWDT, which was a light worthiness demonstration test, which, no, we don't have that. Uh, didn't, I don't have a picture of that. But that represented the command module. It was actually a space frame with a command module system on it. And we took it down to the hyper maintenance facility, which was a special... A, a, facility that was built south of uh, the ONC building just for this purpose, for the Apollo program, for, for the RCS system. And uh, so we checked out the Apollo quad and we we're going to do a fire in. So we wrote all the procedures. We had to load it with 50 gallon drums of repellent. We didn't have any servicing equipment. It wasn't ready. And we we're going to do this, going to do a two second firing on the thrust. Hmm. So we, you know, it was a big build up and uh, I'm up in the little control room there, and, and I've got another engineer in the A station. And I'll talk about that in a second, what the A station was. And he's going to uh, execute the two-second firing from up there. And it was bang. It was all over. You know, there was, there was just a little bit of smoke, and that was, you know, and I thought, boy, what a letdown. You know, <laughs> I wanted to see a sheet of fire come out of the engine, and it, and it, it didn't. Huh. And so uh, I was a little disappointed in this. I said, okay, on the forward on the FWDT, the command module system, I said, we're going to, going to fire those engines for 20 seconds. So we get a, one after the other. We're going to fire all of them, you know. And they oh, yeah, that, that sounds like it'll be a whole lot more fun, you know. <laughs> so we loaded that, and I'm sitting up there and, and looking through this little glass window at the, down into the bay. And, and, uh, and I gave Larry the call. I said, okay, Larry, go ahead, execute the sea start. And a great sheet of fire comes out. It was a different, the... Uh, Command module RCS engine was an ablative engine, so it, it tended to throw pieces of the chamber out, oh. and and it was a great sheet of fire came out right at the half, all the way across the bay. You know, I think, oh geez, <laughs> that's, <laughs> a, that's a whole lot bigger than I ever thought it was going to be, and yeah. uh, and it, it fired for twenty seconds. So as the time passed, you know, twenty seconds sounded felt like it was forever. That I think. Oh, he needs to quit. We need to quit. <laughs> and then the cabling is starting to burn on the far side of the bay. You know, oh things, and there's places filling up with smoke and fumes. And uh, and I said, Larry, turn off the program. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
we uh, we we got through that. It was uh, it was quite exciting, and the and the safety engineer up there with me said, "Is it supposed to do this?" Oh yeah, no, this is normal. This is normal. <laughs> but uh, you know, we were all young guys and, and just basically learning what to do. We we didn't have anybody really coaching us. Nobody nobody knew anything more than we did at the time. So much was the whole Apollo program. It was like uh, the, 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 and did you have a sense of the moon race, John, with uh, the oh, Soviet yeah, Union? Yeah, very much. It, it, except we never knew where they were, but it was always, always a suspicion that they were ahead of us, because mm -hmm. they always had been up to that point. Mm -hmm. Until we got into Gemini, you know, they were always, always were ahead. Gemini mm -hmm. gave us a gave us a leg up. Folks, let's talk. Yeah, talk some people. great stories here from John Tribe. There, okay, that's the outside the, of the uh, quad with the four thrusters. The way you tested it out there. Yep. Yep. In there. Uh the, the program he was just talking about there testing that. And here's your uh and that's the command module reaction control system <clears> with the tanks. And I want you to pay attention there. There's the way the tanks are located, you know, right right around the pressure vessel where the crew were of course was a, a was an inner vessel. Mm hmm And all these tanks and all this equipment was around in what we call the pork chop area, which was the area between pork the pressure chop vessel, area. Between the pressure vessel and the heat shield. Okay. So and there was no, absolutely no access to any of those tanks except to the service imports on the side of the vehicle. Talking about these gray tanks over the, here. The gray tanks, yeah, right. Let me make yep. it smaller. I can point yeah, these tanks right there. Those yep. tanks right there. Yep. You're, that's, there's four there. tanks, two fuel, two ox. Uh-huh. And, so uh, that's so that was the command module and then uh, the other engine on the service module the next picture is the service propulsion system which is the big engine on the back a 20,000 pound thrust engine that is used for uh, well, mid-course co correction mm -hmm. and lunar insertion and earth return so you know a critical engine and I picked up responsibility for that in 69 so then I had all the propulsion systems on the on the Apollo and uh the jump the other... uh, uh uh because you were over that were you over that for apollo 13 mission yes. and the concerns yep. that that would even fire yep. uh were you on the trenches for that yes yeah but what was the feeling well, it, 13 the biggest thing i had on 13 i was in charge of the investigation why the tank blew mm -hmm. so that was that was the that might be you were in case. charge of the investigation all right down down here okay yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I had it the longest hours i ever worked on that Oh really? I had a thirty-five hour day <laughs> on one time. <laughs> thirty-five hour day. Yeah. And I went huh. and I got off and went down to the Ramada Inn. While they were coming back. Of no, course. this was yeah. the, the actual. Oh, oh no, afterwards, it, yeah. It was okay. uh, during the mission. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then I went down to the splashdown party after I'd worked thirty-five hours and had a couple of drinks. I don't know how I got home that night. Really <laughs> Somebody got you home. Yeah. Anyway, you were... let's show the rest of the uh, propulsion yeah. systems on Apollo. That's that's the lunar module and. Uh, Marty knows all about that, but the ascent and the descent systems were not unlike the Apollo. And the, the ascent system had the 16 reaction control thrusters, just like the service module. You can see those at the top mm -hmm. sticking on the, on the corners. And then it also had the ascent engine. And then the, uh, the descent module, of course, just had the descent engine. Mm -hmm. and Marty had, Winkle, our co-producer here, was the electrical engineer on the Grumman yeah, he, module. He knew all about those systems. Yeah, Marty, you have any comment about we we saw this earlier and Grumman's got a beautiful plastic overlay of the whole system and it that looks like one of those in there. But uh, Marty didn't you didn't deal with anything there or did or did you with connecting wires to them? I don't know. I know you know I didn't get real involved in the Grumman operation except one of my responsibilities was provide the fluids, the service and the, the propellants for, for the lunar module. And the command service module and the S4B. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I did get into the into into working with Grumman a little bit on the on the lunar module. Yeah, we're gonna and see the S4B here yeah. in a second. And they 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 had tank problems initially, just like we did, uh, with uh, compatibility with some of the cleaning fluids and the propellants themselves, and and, and Grumman had a real real problem early on, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's one of the reasons why Apollo eight went to the moon without a lunar module was because they were trying to recover from tank issues. I see. But Marty, anyway, you were hitting that UCAC family microphone there, sir. Yeah, we, we had leaks in the tanks. Uh, but when we shipped the uh, vehicle to KSC, we didn't detect any leaks. And when we got to KSC, we did. Problem was we had two different systems detecting leaks. 
In the yeah. one in KC was a bit more critical. That down here we'd use mass spectrometers to, okay. to the nth degree, you know, and uh, spent a lot of time mass specking systems. Trying mass to... spectrometers, yep. big technology back in the 1960s yep. for yep. sure. Yep. That was way to that was the equivalent of how the MRIs and stuff have mm -hmm. gone in medicine today. And yeah, the next, Marty. The next hey, picture well, is sorry, Marty. Well, you're rolling on the mic. We got a uh, text from Bob Seek. Interesting to note that John was a survivor of the German World War II rocketry to later have a career which began with the Germans. Thank yep. you, Bob Seek, yep. for watching today. Absolutely. What a paradox here, Bob Seek, launch director and friend of John Tribes there. Thank you for watching, Bob. Uh, the uh, uh, Yeah, what a paradox that uh, now you're immersed in this, this technology that... Uh, you know, yeah, trying to kill uh, your family in your country. One of the launches years, I here. talked about earlier, the which was the Mariner to Venus, Mariner Two. Yes. Uh, I was actually sitting next to Werner von Braun in Complex Twelve Blockhouse, and, and I'm a green young engineer, and he's the, the national icon even back in those days. So I wasn't about to initiate a conversation with him, but I'm sitting as close as I am to you now. Yes. And when we walked out after one scrub, he, he did turn to me and say, ah, these, these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I, and that's what yeah. I said 18 years previously. Yeah. You know, he was heading up the workforce that, that, that bombed the crap out of my street. Well, what was your feeling? Uh, I, I, you move on. You move uh -huh. on. It, it's a different world. It's a different time, different world. Uh, uh -huh. it, it didn't bother me. Some, some people, st it still bothers yes right yeah uh, but uh, i i i respected the fact that what he was trying to do mm -hmm. was uh, you know for the good of mankind and, and then you saw von braun from a distance what's your assessment of the, the man i i never i never knew him i never never got to work with him or never got to talk with him at any length okay. so I, I really don't know yeah. uh he was a very he's one of those people that walk into a room and take command you know he was he, he was you know, an impressive guy, a little bit like Rocco Patron, mm -hmm. uh, except much more diplomatic. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, Rock, Rocco was a take command guy, too, but he did it a little more brutally sometimes, you know. Yes. Uh, Rocco was over launch operations. Rock, Rocco was Space the Air. launch director down here for uh, the Apollo program. Uh, you had a personal encounter with Rocco since you mentioned him. You want to well, we tell yeah, that story? Let, let's just let, let me just show you one okay. other uh, piece of hardware on the... Yeah, uh, we're going to talk about the Saturn 1-4. Uh, the Saturn 4B, uh, people didn't realize it, but it had two hyperpods called the Auxiliary Propulsion System. And you can see right on the top at the right railway, there, right there, yeah, yeah, that's it. The AFT skirt, and that's the auxiliary propulsion system systems right there. And they were also hypergol because the S4B had to work in space, and uh, you didn't want a cryogenic system for for their application. They, with a single J2 engine on the S4B, you've got no roll control unless you use thrusters. So you had roll, pitch, and yaw in those apps. Plus mm -hmm. a uh, an ullage engine, so that when it fired for uh, lunar insertion, you would do a firing of those apps pods first to settle the propellants before you fired the big engine. So that's mm -hmm. why. So also we're providing propellants. My group's providing the propellants to the S four B. Hmm. And uh, never knew that. Never thought about all these hypergolics. We're going to talk about them in detail here in a minute. That's just a view of the pod with the uh, with the four engines on it. So many specialty areas, yeah, of, of each, so many each, areas of, of the, I mean, this is a whole career for people right there, just that absolutely. engine. Yep, yep. Yeah, that, that, that's so amazing. Okay, and there, there's a, a view of uh, the mobile server structure and the Saturn V out at 39. And, and down at the 22-foot the, uh, level, minus 22-foot level, if mm -hmm. you look, it's just virtually just a little bit above the ground. Marty's going to point that out, I think was where the uh, all our servicing equipment was okay and so we would pump propellant up the mss to the command module the service module the lunar module and the s4b from there from there yeah so the propellants were not loaded in at the o o o no, we, we were in processing they were loaded at the pad right they were loaded at the they're going to show some yeah, and, equipment uh, there yeah and it was all done with mobile servicing units. And here's some out at pad 34. You've got to realize that at this time, 
you know, I, I'd started off with uh, with one engineer. Uh, by the time I got picked up SPS, I was up to 40 engineers. The group, you know, it was it, we had all the responsibility for these units. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what you're looking at there is a couple of uh, service propulsion servicing units. And they have to pump, you know, they have to be brought in and connected up and pump propellant up the stack. And uh, so that was uh, that was at pad 34. But we have people at pad 34, 37, 39A, 39B, 16, hyper facility, MSOB. I had people scattered all over the Cape and KSC. You know, uh -huh. it was a it was a big group. And that's the view with that. Well, we just can't go back. Yeah, yeah, that's the view looking from the top of the MSS down at the servicing units. You see them all down there. Yeah, the white tanks yep. down there here. And right the there. and then it's more down at the uh, far at the top. I see. We, we had down there was a toxic vapor disposal unit. Now, now hypergols, you know, as I think everybody is aware, they're very toxic, very carcinogenic. I don't think they are aware. I was going to ask you, John, to speak of how how dangerous these these fuels yeah, are. Yeah, the fuels are very dangerous, and and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we would do to protect the people that have okay yes stuff. right yeah yeah we got but uh, so anyway the next picture that unit right there is called a toxic vapor disposal unit so when you have to get rid of the fumes you know when you're doing a tank in operation you can't just dump them into the air because they they settle and uh, and they don't blow away unless you've got a good wind so we would use these toxic vapor disposal units to dilute the fumes we would have, they would blow air out of those units at 600 cubic feet per minute Hmm. And the tank on the left there is called a liquid separator. We would blow the fumes into that tank first to get the liquid out of the system and then just have the fumes being blown out and diluted by air and, and cleared. But uh, That's a heavy-duty liquid separator in that picture. Initially, we used a 50-gallon drum uh, with neutralizer in it, and that didn't work real well. So we had a couple blow up <laughs> wow. on pad 34, and another time we... We filled it up and it went and it overflowed into the into the unit and blew out raw propellant. Uh -huh. And we gassed the gardener over at pad thirty four one time. You know, oh so, my gosh! So you know, it's it was. He survived, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't kill anybody in the program, but we we had some near misses. You know. But uh, so that that was the uh, that was the toxic vapor units, and going going through uh, that's a, that's a typical service in timeline. Are we there yet? I don't think we got to that point yet. Let's see. Right. Yeah, on, that's yeah. this is this is. Well, we've go got back to that. Yeah, that's. And then that's. Uh, that's right. Let's go on to the scape suits. Okay. While, while we're talking hypers. Yeah, we're right. We're right here. Yeah, Escape yeah. suits. That the uh, technicians had to be protected. Obviously, yeah. working with this stuff. So much of our operation was manual. And, uh, and that was generally we had no automatic loading systems. Uh, no automatic connections to the vehicle. Everything was a was a plunky. Hey, let me show you this. Okay. This is this is a a typical SPS service and disconnect. This is the airborne side. Okay. Little artifact from the Apollo era here. That's uh, we, we and this is a ground service and disconnect. You can, That's a lot heavier, and got that. So it's, the technician has to come along with this in a scape suit. That weighs about six, about eight pounds, actually. Yeah, it's it's about like heavy. a gallon of milk. Okay, put that on. Okay, lock it on, and then you open the handle. This is all manual. You see, this is this is Heath Robinson stuff. We're considering this the Apollo. Right. Program. And now the valve is open. That's opening the valve to to put the hypergolics well, in. Yep. To a connector here on the spacecraft. Yeah, yep. this is the connector here. This is this is just added to it to give a connection. Back. I see. Yeah, that I can see the uh, twisting on that there. So, but th those, uh, you know, the technicians, the quality, the engineers, uh, the uh, technicians, and the inspectors are in these heavy, cumbersome scape suits. And we'll go back to the scape yeah. suit. Yeah. And but, what's the acronym for scape, Marty? You were certified in it, sir. Self-contained atmospheric protective ensemble. 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 Yeah. Okay, I, I would have guessed uh, equipment. And my ensemble. managers, in their infinite wisdom, said that hey, if the technicians have to wear those suits, those suits, so do the engineers. They have to understand what it's like to, to be in it. So we were all scape certified. 
Hmm. We were all forced to take the escape suit uh, ex testing and, and go. In fact, in the early days, we were on station 12 hours on, 12 hours off in escape suit. And you do, when you're in, a, in, the, in the 12 hours, it's one hour in the suit, one hour out of the suit. And, uh, you know, you go in, you would uh, put the sit, put the suit on like you, like the guy in the middle there is he's kind of sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, then you would put on the boots and they would lock the boots on your feet. Then they would put the backpack, you'd have long johns on, and you'd tape the long johns around your arms and legs to, so they wouldn't roll up. Then oh. they would put the backpack on you. And then they would take the whole suit and pull it up over your head and, and, and fit the helmet in place and lock, lock it all up and zip it up. And when you're in that suit, it's uncomfortable. It's either too cold, too hot. It doesn't bend easy. Uh, it's got big, heavy rubber gloves that you can't pick things up. You've got no, it's like the astronauts on an EVA. You've got no, no feel in your fingertips. Hmm. And uh, I had one, one of my engineers, the, uh, the backpack malfunctioned. And instead of blowing chilled air at the extremities, it, it blew liquid air. And the liquid air caused the plastic lines to break. So he got liquid air dumped on his on his flesh and burned him. Yeah. He had to do an emergency egress and get out of the suit. So, you know, it's it, this yeah, was yeah. One, of, one of the joys of working uh, with Hypergoals. We have one of these escape suits on display in our workers' gallery here at the museum. Yep, we do. In there. Yep. And uh, parts of it, anyway. It's yep. not a complete... On there, Marty, you gonna say something? Well, yeah. Once you get that escape suit on, then it's a long walk up to the, in our case, a three hundred twenty foot level. Well, we we yeah, we, we would uh, they'd put us in a van and give us take us to the to the ramp, and then we'd have to get the elevator. But there's a lot of Marty's right, a lot of walking involved. It, it was uncomfortable. Uh, and of course, you got the ambient temperatures here in Florida, uh, ninety yep. degrees for you know five months of the, the season. The only good thing the mosquitoes couldn't get. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, mosquito proof. Okay, press on. We can. Yeah, all right. There's, there's the there's, more they, of the, the van. crew yep. there getting yep. in the van, it's and uh, we got. Uh, uh, yeah, then we're there. We're now we're going segue okay. here. Okay. Segue okay. here to a little little different part of the Apollo program. Now this is a, a, a slightly different story and a very tragic one. Of course, is Apollo one. Uh, we we uh, fight. We launched. Uh, what we called AS-201 and AS-202, which was spacecraft 9 and 11, and we had spacecraft 12 on the pad, and that was, uh, we, we called it AS-204 at the time. Uh, subsequently, it was called Apollo 1. And uh, on the 27th of January, 1967, I assigned a young engineer that had just joined the group to work second shift that night because the test that was supposed to plugs out test that we were running that day should have terminated uh, on first shift, but it didn't. It dragged on. There was a lot of problems during the day. Crew were aboard. And the, the guy I'd assigned to, he says, hey, I, I can't work second. He said, I've got college tonight. I said, okay, I'll just stay over. So that was not um, not abnormal at all back in those days as you'd work two shifts. So I just stayed over on second shift. And uh, one of the things we did that night at 6 o'clock, uh, Skip Chauvin, who was the test conductor, said, John, he said, let's just go ahead and do the simulated static fire. One of the things we were going to do on the Apollo prior to launch was to static fire the thrusters on the service module. So uh, Gus and, and, and Skip and I went through the procedure for that, which, which was, as I said, was simulated. We wanted to get a timeline. So I'm just pretending the thrusters fire and it's not, of course. And and Skip and, and uh, Gus is ticked off because the comm is real bad, you know, and that's when he said, how the hell are we going to talk between Moon and us if we can't even talk between four buildings on, on, on the ground? So uh, Skip said, hey, let's just take a break here and, and uh, see if we can clear up the comm before we go into the 10 minutes. They were, at that time, it was T minus 10 minutes in the count before we pick up the terminal count. And I'm sitting there right in the TPS and dead, everything's dead quiet. We're up in the A station. And the A station is the automatic checkout equipment station. It's, it's the control room for the spacecraft. And it's up next to the astronaut quarters. Now, a lot of people think we're all in the fire in the big firing room. We're not. All the spacecraft people, Marty, Lunar people, as well as our own, are all up in the ONC building. So I'm up in that A station, and it's dead quiet. And I hear fire. 
and I turned around to uh, Dave Stewart who was sitting next to me and I said fire what's he talking about fire get us out and you know and it's we're burning up and then a scream and then dead silence again and of course we're all shudders you know what the hell is going on and Skip was trying to call the pad could not reach anybody the pad leader was off the net and uh, it was dead silence for a couple of minutes there and uh, the uh, Skip but uh, finally I guess, I guess he finally got hold of Don Babbitt who was the pad leader out on the pad he said you know Don what, what the hell's going on he says I can't begin to describe and I said oh shit you know this is this is bad news so I called went over to, we had one phone in the A station you know one, one on every mm. console like they mm. have now I went over to that one phone and I called my wife and they said we've had an accident out here and I'm going to be late I said I'm fine don't worry about me but I'm, I'm not be home on time I hung up the phone and Dave Stewart came up behind me and he picked the phone and he says what's the matter with the phone it's dead that KSC had cut all the phone lines I turned around and a guard was locking the door of the ace station locking us in and uh and then of course we got got talking to the guys out of the pad and we started to get the information on you know what was happening they uh, they gathered us all our equipment all our books and smarts hmm. photograph and uh, our drawings gathered them all up and took them away and then they bust us all out to 34 and at that time of course the bodies were still up in, in the spacecraft they were there till after midnight and uh, again it was a long night with 2 30 we got off they let they made us give tape depositions of what we were doing when we were doing it last action that happened was, was was he threw one of my switches so you know I'm, hmm. I'm center of attention you know okay we, one of your switches it was just a selector switch for god's sake right uh, but we had no idea what had happened or how it had happened at that point hmm. uh, but we were back in again 6 30 the next morning let's look at that uh, picture there that is a that's not a picture that you've seen much of you see a lot of the burned hatch and that sort of stuff but this is a, a view in the in the, on the level of, the, of where the fire was you can see the fire extinguishers scattered around and the debris uh, technicians i had a technician working up there that night and he was working in the, one of those command module panels right next to the uh, next to the thrusters and when the uh, pressure vessel blew on the spacecraft the fire came out through those open panels and right before we broke for 10 minutes i told him to go take a cigarette break hmm. otherwise he'd have been standing right there where the fire blew out on that open panel there you're talking about see the see all the stuff down there on the the, the, the lines and things yes yeah, so, working uh, there yeah uh, so that, that was a uh, that was a, a really critical night were you part of the investigation then yeah we we it went on you know we for the first for the first couple of weeks for the first couple of months we were wondering whether the program would survive or not but going back in again the next morning to have to listen to those tapes of those screams over and over again trying to get a timeline oh. was, was pretty pretty grim yeah and and we'd walk across the board the the uh, crosswalk between the uh, two high bays and the onc and the astronauts three vets were sitting down there red white and blue vets uh -huh. and, and they were there for a long time uh -huh and uh well thanks for sharing that john yeah, that's uh we know that's an emotional time for you and our stay curious visitor stay curious watchers have just heard one of the most uh on the scene stories i've ever heard about the apollo one fire from you sir thank you for sharing that that's There's, the uh, inside of the hatch that famous picture there yeah. this is an interesting it, picture john's gonna yeah uh, that uh I'm kind of in the way there for the yeah. arrow. See the we'll do it this see way. the the white yeah, where the, that red arrow on the floor is yeah, there. Yeah, where the red arrow yeah, on the floor right is. There. Yep, that 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 is the suspect harness that sparked. So what are we looking at there? That's You're not the actual. The, that's uh, inside the command module. Two hundred four spacecraft. In, in, no, it's not. Two, it's just another vehicle, but it's with the hatch with the. Uh, uh, Seats, seats, removed. seats removed you're looking at the east lss bay and that was where right, my head's at is where this yeah, is right, the fire right, right in that area was 
was where, in fact, Gus was standing uh -huh. at the time of the fire. And you're convinced he he gotten out of the center couch to stand up and maybe check out the comm he, wire. He huh? was he was out of his couch checking comm cables. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the six guys that uh, took no, turns. No, there's five there. I'm sorry, there's five guys. The sixth guy was the NASA quality guy who is not in the picture. He was, but he was uh, one of one of the one of the six guys that got the NASA Exceptional Bravery Medal. They worked in pairs to try and get those hatches off and get the guys out. Burn their hands. And they're, you know, all, they're all dead now except the guy on the left, Jim Gleaves. You know, I was looking at that panel just over the weekend at the Saturn V Center and looking at the board with mm -hmm. their and their, their accommodations is to the left of that, yeah. if you've been out there. I built that board. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. God bless you, man. That, yeah. I, was I, had to make, I had to make up all the badges. I was actually it. looking for your, your badge up there, but no, then I, want, I, I, I realized you, yeah. you just explained that you were actually in the operations and yeah. checkout building, and we've got yeah. a picture of that situation here towards the end of your talk. We should have moved it up there uh, a little but, uh, server up there. Go to the next one. I think this one of uh, that's Jim now. Jim, Jim and me having lunch. He's was he's still a good friend. That's awesome that you stay in touch with so many people. But he and that that's that's he was one of my first techs when I started checking out the mm -hmm. quad, and he was also the guy that was he's the only guy left from mm -hmm. the six that tried to get the hatch open. These space workers, they stay in touch with each other. Of course, being in Florida and living around here is, is easy to do, but uh, uh, I, I, I like seeing you guys together. And uh, one other story that's kind of interesting is, oh, six months after the fire, Lola Mauer, who was the astronaut secretary, called me up and said, uh, John, can, uh, can you come on over? He said, we, we finally got around to clearing out Gussie's desk. And uh, there's an envelope for you here, your name on it. Wow. And uh, and I went over there, and two days before the fire, I'd ask Gus if he'd give me a signed photograph of the crew for my parents who were visiting from England. Hmm. And in that envelope was the signed photograph. And that's it there. And that's it. Uh, that, that is worth a small fortune, folks. Uh, God bless our heroes there, Ed White, Gus Grissom, and Roger Chaffee. Uh just uh i get emotional thinking about it my friend yes. just i can't imagine how you feel from time to time about it but uh and of course we all know gus probably would have been the first man on the moon quite had he possibly get... quite yes. possibly yep. Yep. <laughs> and uh this is me kneeling down there by yes. the command module on uh, apollo 7. this is you know the same level as we saw earlier that's you right there yep yeah okay and uh had the famous blue cover how it was that, shipped on yeah, there. That... This was, the, of course, a Block 2 vehicle. We'd switched from a Block 1. Apollo 1 was a Block 1. This is now a Block 2 vehicle, uh, bigger and better. And just like every accident we've ever had in the space program, they, we always come out in better shape afterwards. Because, yes. Because we've learned. Yes. And uh, Something would have happened in orbit, time, maybe, huh? Uh, Do you go beyond the hour? No, we're fine. Yeah, okay, we, well, go, we go two hours, so, Mr. John Tribe here. So after, you know, after the, this is Apollo Seven now, and we're getting we're back in flow again, and uh, and hopefully uh, with a safer, smarter group of people and safer procedures. How was that dip from the, the oh, depths was, of despair to, was, to rising up to the triumph? Well, what you've got to realize is that you know the fire occurred in January of 1967. We launched the first Saturn V in October of 67. It was just a matter of months later that that giant rocket lifted off and was totally successful. So we went from, you know, what looked like the end of the program to, hey, we're off and moving. Mm -hmm. The rocket works. You know, everybody wondered about it. That's important. <laughs> and uh, so and now we're, we're, now we're talking 1968. And, uh, and I'm getting ready to try and load the spacecraft propellants for the first time using the mobile servicing units instead of using 50-gallon drums. Uh -huh. So I'm doing tanking tests. Up, we have test tanks set up there next to the vehicle and we're loading propellants into the tanks and out and in and out and training guys testing the equipment testing the procedures and i'm i'm at home it's a sunday and the phone rings and, and the guy my, my engineer says no oh, we got a we got a weird situation up here he said we've got oxidizer coming out of the vacuum pump i said what how can you have oxidizer he said I think we must have had oxidizer in the tank when we pulled the vacuum on it. I said, oh, jeez. 
And I said, all right, I'm coming out. So I went rushing out there. And uh, Norm Carlson is waiting for me at the gate. The Test conductor Norm Test Carlson. And Norm says, Drive, what the hell have you done to my rocket? I said, what happened? He said, you washed acid all down the side of it. What the tech had done, they, they, they poured, because of a disconnect issue, they had actually sucked oxidizer into the, an oil, oil tank of a vacuum pump and out the vent hole. And in fact, he said, I could put my thumb on it and stop it. You know, he said, but after we had oxidizer all over the place, we figured we'd better hose it off. Well, he took like a, a gallon of oxidizer and turned it into 400 gallons of nitric acid with that fire hose. And it ran all down the side of the vehicle. It went into every little thane surface all the way down. So I was in deep yogurt. That was when I got to meet Rocco for the first time. Uh-huh. And how'd that go? Well, I'm, I'm walking down the hall with my, my manager, my director, and my vice president. And, you know, they said, you better come along. I said, oh, okay. Well, I'm thinking I'm going to sit around the side in the in the, in the thought herd section. They pushed me into the seat right in front of Rocco. They all go sit around the back. <laughs> okay. So it was me having to talk, tell him what happened. And, and I, I smart enough to know Rocco... What didn't handle bullshit well at all. So I just told him the facts, told him what we were going to do to fix it. And uh, he was very nice about it. And uh, But still intimidating as all get out. He's a great big guy, great mm -hmm. big desk, big barrel chest. He was ex-Army football mm -hmm. player. He played for the national team in 44, I think. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he'd scare the heck out of anybody, especially a young engineer like me. But uh, it turned out we got to be good friends. In fact, he, he, he would call me after he retired, way back in the, in the 1990s, just to find out how things were going down here. Wow. And we he lived into his 80s. He was a gentle giant, yeah. I think. Yeah, he, he lived really out really at uh, Costa Mesa. And uh, he, he, he was a funny guy. He would call and say, you know, how's things going? And I'd, start, I'd get into some technical issue, and it would remind him of something. And he'd be off. And then I'd just sit and listen for 45 minutes while he would recount mm -hmm. infinite details, terminal board numbers, pins, you know, just of, of things that happened huh. about 40 years ago. You know, wow. great, a wonderful guy. Yep. Rocco Patron, Rocco John Patron. Tribe's talking about here. We honor him in our museum, on our wall here, of our, in our Apollo Gallery. Yeah. And we've got his hard hat we loaned yep. to the uh, K Space Center mm -hmm. out there. To, and the to Launch display. Control Center, of course, is now the Rocco A Patron Launch Control that's Center. That's right. Yep, and that's, that's all because of John Tribe lobbied for that. And uh, we're proud of that, and you, John. Got a question, Marty, or comment? Yeah, I got a question from Tom Thumb. Were fiber optics used both to and from the launch pad in those days, or was it all copper wire? I think it was all copper wire. But, you know, I'm I'm not an electrician and or, or an avionics guy, but I'm pretty sure it was. I know on the Atlas pads it was all copper wire. We didn't have any fiber optics. I suspect Apollo was much the same. Well, John's got a couple more stories to tell. There he is, looking handsome back in the day. Why don't you grab your helmet there, your hard hat? Got the very same hard hat. There. The same hard hat with. Uh, well, you can see the decals on the back. Yeah, you've got there's his same hard hat. Oh, that's that's uh, going crazy in our green screen there. So uh, uh, look at that. How interesting is that? With put something your, behind it. Yeah, I can put something behind it there. I'll stay curious. It, well, yeah. anyway, I, well, we always had decals yeah, on the we hat. We always got stuff behind it there. There you go. Anyway, love that. that, that that's awesome. That's an heirloom of the space age there. And the uh, good looking there, and there you are at your desk. Oh, you look young. <laughs> yes, if, uh, you look yep. great there. And, that was uh, in the ONC building, and uh, pretty organized there. It looks like uh, this. This yeah. is interesting. The yeah. uh, you've heard of the Snoopy cartoons? Yes. You yes. Know, in the uh, every day on the Apollo program on the CSM, we would put out a, a twenty-four hour schedule with with. Uh, every test that was scheduled that day and back uh i think on uh, i think it was on the apollo 7 uh, ernie reyes introduced the snoopy cartoon ernie reyes was a nasa ops guy here's ernie and you yeah that, that that's us and then snoopy in the background but uh, ernie came up with uh, he would sketch up a little snoopy that that it was very esoteric. It would, it would be revolve around something that had happened that day or the day before 
and if it if it was embarrassing, so much the better. You know, we were embarrassed <laughs> right. people, and so each Poking day fun of somebody yeah, all the time. Yeah, and you see, and that that one that you see right there, that cartoon, it's kind of hard to see, but. Uh, that was one I drew. I was one of the artists that, that drew these Snoopies. There was Al Tinarello and uh, Ernie Reyes and Chuck Davis. We would we would all draw them hmm. and, and because, you know, otherwise it was too much of a load on one person. And and we'd be in, you know, in on some issue that had happened so we could draw them up. But that one is where I sent Marty Schofaletti, who was one of my guys. He was a real dapper dresser. You know, back in those days, we had all the colored shirts and ties and and I sent him out to the trailer at the pad to be lead engineer out there. And the trailers were really bad. You know, they were dirty and, and, and uh, the air conditioning was either you know, it didn't work or else it worked too much and ran, everything ran with water. And, <laughs> and that, was, that was just a little Snoopy showing Marty facing trailer life, you know, with bugs everywhere and mosquitoes. <laughs> but uh, Sno Snoopies were, uh, they, they became politically quite important because we would also use them to display anything we were unhappy about. So management would, would start to look at these, you know, and, and get a feel for, oh, I better go fix this. Mm. Uh, I did one one time, uh, they had a major locks leak out on the pad, you know, and, and there was gox everywhere, you know, great clouds of it. And Wackenhut, we were the security people at the time, kept roaring out there in their police cars, and, and one drove right into the, into the cloud and just ignited the whole car just burst into flames the guy leapt out and here comes a second car drives right in next to it blows up as well <laughs> liquid oxygen in the well, air and the... glaciers oxygen everything burns you know yeah. just, just like apollo one of course and uh so you know they destroyed two vehicles there in a flash the next day the snoopy i drew all said you know how come we can never get a gsa government supplied Never get a GSA car. Wackenhut has cars to burn. <laughs> and the Wackenhut guy said, "I want that guy fired." Whoever drew that, <laughs> fired. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, at the uh, the NASA management said, "You know, no, we don't. That, that's them talking to us. We don't don't fire people for that." Huh. But, but uh, so next day, the Snoopy. I think I think only drew it was showing me being dragged off in chains by whacking <laughs> is that right yeah. oh i'll have to find that that that's uh these snoopies became incorporated with the apollo mission they were involved in i've yeah. seen them all stapled together yeah. ernie used uh, to package them up at the end of every every mission yeah and, and they, there's not a lot of them around but there's a bit i think when he died the complete set came to you guys yes and they're, they're worth a couple hundred dollars all day long yeah. in auctions yep. and so forth and snoopy became the mascot of the Apollo program uh, uh, through Apollo 10, calling their command yep. module Charlie Brown and yep. Snoopy for the lunar module on there. So great story. We could have you back and just talk about well, that. I've got one, one other story. And that's yeah. just, you know, we, we'll go on now to Apollo 16. There's, there's Ernie there, rest in peace, Ernie Reyes. Uh, so much like you in uh, Bob Seek and Charlie Mars, our godfather, you were interviewed extensively for the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, uh, now four or five years ago. Uh, and I know Ernie was uh, there. We'll talk about your Apollo 16 experience there. But what was that like to be, I mean, you guys are really immortalized in documentaries and so forth about Apollo uh, the, uh, 11. I'm not sure. I, immortalized, I think, is a little stretching it a little bit. But uh, no, we, we, you know, we, we were just there. You know, we're, the trouble is, you know, Apollo is now a long time ago you know it's over 50 years ago and then the number of people that are walking and talking that worked on apollo are getting fewer and fewer yes sir you know ernie's gone uh bob yeah. Deke and i yeah. it's anyway hanging together maybe it's our scuba diving training that yeah. uh, keeps us going but uh that's why we so appreciate that you spending your time sharing these stories oh, with us it, today it's, that's all we got left that's, that's all we got stories. left well, we're gonna you're gonna hear another great story that involves charlie duke thanking you for possibly well, uh saving his ride to the moon but uh, here's your mates on the uh yeah this was my crew at the uh this was uh, apollo 15 and mm -hmm. we're now down to like 17 people remember we were up at 40 at one time now we're down to 17. my there's three of us left out of that group huh and uh, you don't see many pictures like that of teams of people in front of the vehicle no you know you do shuttle 
Yeah. They, you find those all over the place. They bust them out regularly. But they did not. Like. They did not encourage that back then. Huh. I, I forced them to, to to let me do that, and uh, I'm kind of glad I did because it's a great souvenir now. Yeah, absolutely. You see a few. I've seen pictures of the Grummies together, Marty. It, uh, but they're always in formal shots here at KSC at Beth Page. They yeah, we they, I made them all put their launch jackets on and wear a tie. Yeah, you know? yeah, in there. Anyway, on, on Apollo sixteen, uh, we were doing our testing out on the pad. It was about a month before launch, and uh, I came in that, that morning, and, and I beat my my engineer. It's uh, giving me a third shift tie, and they said, "Yes, there's some really strange data here. We don't understand." let me see it and i was going over it with them and i said well that, the only way that makes sense is that the bladder's busted remember i talked to you about the bladders inside the tanks mm -hmm. this was to, the command to put the pressure to get it out you can't the command on module the, the command module tanks which were buried up inside the pork chop mm -hmm. area uh i said god you know uh -oh. so, so uh, if, if that's the case and you know, we looked at more data, and I said, that's, that's the only answer. It is. I walked down the hall to my director, and I said, I think we've got a busted bladder in the command module. He said, well, what does that mean? I said, roll back. Well, we'd never rolled a Saturn V back. So, you know, he immediately realized the seriousness of the situation. And uh, you know, what we had to do was to get to that tank, we had to roll the whole Saturn V back to the VAB. So this is February 71, approximately. Right, February 71. And uh, that, that's just a picture of the uh, of the command service module, SLAW. The SLAW is the spacecraft lunar module adapter, that yeah. big uh, Tixie cup shape. At the Marty's uh, Marty's vehicle in, inside that, right there. Look at the gentlemen above my head that are in the Saturn IV B. All right, this is in the foreground, the SLAW and the... Uh, you get a real, you get an appreciation for the size of yeah. this program when you see the picture That's like that. a neat that. picture there. Anyway, we have to go back to the VAB. We have to destack the CSM slaw, put them on a trailer, roll that all back to the ONC building, go into the ONC building, take this command module service module off the slaw, leave the leave the lunar module in the slaw, hmm. take the uh, command module off the service module. There Take it that is. Back. That's you in that, the foreground. Yep, yeah. and then the uh, that's not the same service command module, but that, I'm just showing you that's what it was like. And uh, and then we had to take the heat shield off the command module, which we'd never done before. Wow. So we had to take that big heat shield off, to get to that tank. Then we had to get the tank out, and we had to replace it and retest it, and put it all back, and then go backwards through all that, through to the pad, and we did it all in two weeks. North American fly out a whole team out there, or did you? No, it was all our, our, our guys. All your guys. And, and, and you did it in how long? Two weeks. Two weeks. And uh, now, so the it actually launched in April 1971, yeah. and uh, that two week delay there, uh, you you got a story about meeting the. Of course, that was yes. Moonwalker John Young and rookie Charlie Duke, and uh, orbiting was Tom Mattingly. This was his command module, Tom mm -hmm. Mattingly. Yep. And uh, it's about uh, what you had to understand, though, that t that two week period was absolutely miserable for us. You know, we, we had slipped the launch a month, so everybody was pounding on us. You know, you, it, 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 and, and the reason it happened was a technician screwed up. He would connected a connection and he hadn't screwed it on far enough. He thought he'd gone all the way on and opened it up, but he hadn't. He'd left it closed. So the pressure was not getting to both sides of the bladder. That's why it broke. So it was a technician error, but engineering should have caught it. You know, if, if we'd had a sharp engineer on station, he should have realized that by looking at his pressures. And that engineer didn't catch it. So they beat on us so badly that I had one guy have a stroke and, and died. Oh, my gosh. Another guy mailed his badges in. He said, I can't take this anymore. And he would, I said, I'm not coming back. And, and the morale of the, the group of morale was wonderful prior to that point. And it collapsed. We had threat of a union. The, the uh, union people came in, and we were we were really it was the worst period of my life. Not I'm not kidding. And uh, and then about ten years ago, I'm at a big NASA event with Charlie Duke. And he and I are talking about this bladder incident. He said, "So you were involved in that bladder incident?" I said, "Yeah, yeah. That was uh, 
it was my group that was you know primarily involved he says well he said let me shake you by the hand he said i got pneumonia they were getting ready to pull me off the crew he said you you slipped the launch a month and i got to walk on the moon and Holy he reached cow. over and shook my hand <laughs> and i said well you know a little silver lining to all that that mess back there in 72. wow so, now I did my research, John. You know, if and we did poll Apollo thirteen, of course, pulled a crew member there. Maddenly was yep. pulled, and uh, Schweiker or uh, uh, Jack Schweiker, Jack Schweiker went. Him, yep. If uh, you know who would have gone to the who was uh, uh, Charlie Duke's backup on Apollo sixteen? And Maddenly, Edgar Mitchell. Oh yeah, yeah, Moonwalker. Mm -hmm. Edgar Mitchell would have replaced. Uh, Charlie Duke well, okay. and would have walked on the moon twice. Well, that would be unique because he would be he would basically the 14 was the backup for 16 yeah. because yeah. and then on 17 it was the crew of uh, 16 mm -hmm. that backed up 17 yeah. basically uh, because the program was over and they didn't want to train any new guys for yeah. that. But uh, boy, yeah, Charlie Duke, uh, you got well, something to talk to him about if you ever see him again, Marty. Because he attended all those Grummy reunions. Yeah, in fact, stuff. I've seen him lots of times since then. You know, at the Grumman reunion, we, we talked about it. Yes. Again, you know, uh -huh. yeah. Well, we're getting near the end. I well, think. John, just an excellent talk here. I, this is the uh, <coughs> control center at the yeah, there's, operations there's very, and checkout that you Very few about. photos of the A station around. You call it the A station? I, I have automatic checkout equipment. We just, okay. There were four A stations on the third floor of the ONC, two for Grumman, two for North American. This is where you were. And for this the, is uh... this was where I was when the fire occurred, and uh, and also here I'm just briefing uh, some Rockwell management. Mm -hmm. Well, we have enjoyed this. Who are the who's in the striped shirt there? Striped shirt is big old Tom O'Malley. Aha! Uh -huh, he another... was our he was our VP at the time, down here, and he'd been my boss on and off for a whole career. Yeah. Because he was the boss over at Convair, and uh, he was, and then he was the boss at Rockwell. Another figure like Rocco Patron that yep. uh, got the job done, and uh, he pushed the button. He pushed launched... the button to launch John Glenn. Yeah, we've got that button right in the next room, Mayor. Courtesy me. Courtesy you? Yeah, I, I, I went. Uh, okay, I thought it was Mr. Solid. No, no, no. I, uh, Anne O'Malley gave it to me and said, what am I going to do with it? Shall I give it to the Smithsonian? And I said, no, if it goes to the Smithsonian. It'll sit in a drawer and nobody will ever see it. I said, let me give it to the the space museum up here there you go john what a great guy you've been to our american space museum here you are in front of the vab looking good there my friend doug forrest is watching today from los angeles he's a a, a pencil artist a par excellence dave stang he's up in michigan cynthia rossi we see her out the astronaut encounters carlton bailey's a rocket photographer i, think I, you know, I know carlton, know carlton yeah Robert Law is up in Dundee, Scotland, enjoying your cocktail, my friend, there with the... Well, tell, tell him that my son lives in Arrow, Scotland. Oh, does he? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have Robert in the States here soon. we got the Astronaut Files watching and Space Monkey and Tommy Usiax there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Bob Seek's watching. All right, for his, probably on his yacht out there. At the, oh yeah, yeah. At the uh, <laughs> off the, the the lake or off the river out there. Uh, Bill Whiting's up in Michigan. Marina R. She is in uh, uh, Dinapro, Ukraine, watching today. Really? Uh, yep. Tom Thumbs watching. We've you probably got Ophelia is in France watching today. Uh, we got uh, uh, Cliff Watson. He'll be watching the show from uh, Pomona, Australia, where they're well, I, getting their, their I uh, in bowl into death. <laughs> summer on there. So uh, we uh, really appreciate you today. There's a perfect way to send you out. John, yeah, one of my favorite guys. Tells you had a good story about that to send us out today. Yeah, uh, this I think it was STS-111 on the shuttle, and, and I had a crew family out there. I was, I was retired by this time, and I had the crew family. They, gave me the job of taking crew family out to watch the launch and I'd gone in to get a cup of coffee in the Apollo building and uh, Jay Honeycutt was there with with a group of people and I never paid attention to who he was with and, and Jay said uh, hey come up, tell me about the SpaceX static fire that, that, that occurred that day I was telling him and this guy reaches in and he said oh, excuse me sir, can I introduce myself I'm Neil Armstrong so, oh, <laughs> no introduction needed sir he really introduced himself he, he really did he said let me introduce myself huh. and uh and then they wandered off and left neil and i there and we, we just just bs for 15 minutes and i had to go back to 
get with the family. And later on, I came in and looked, and he was totally surrounded by the public. Mm-hmm. And the security were beating their way in to go haul him away and get him, get him. Right. Otherwise, he wasn't. He was in a, in a pu- public area, and nobody had recognized him. Huh. It's really strange. Well, that's a beautiful encounter, and you've met many people like that in your career. I know, John, and uh, uh, just thank you, thank you for doing this wonderful program with us today. Uh, do you have one? Did you want to say anything that you hadn't gotten to say about uh, the Apollo era or whatever? No, it was. You know, there's no question that it was uh, an amazing accomplishment of uh, a lot of people. Four hundred thousand people mm-hmm. made Apollo work, and. Uh, I would like to think that that atmosphere and that challenge existed still today. I'm not sure it does, but uh, there's a lot of really good, smart people out at KSC, and and I hope uh, they get to uh, meet their goals and, and and fill their dreams like we did, like we young people did back then, 60 years ago. It was. Uh, you know, we were just, we, I was just so fortunate, blessed to have been around during what, I, what we call the, the golden age of space. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and I think there'll be another golden age of space. I am so impressed with, uh, with SpaceX and, and the speed and the challenge that they are bringing to the program. But, no, I don't, I don't have a lot else to say. I'm, 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 I'm still totally involved by the space business. I'm still working as a docent. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this last Monday, day before yesterday, I did a a uh, well. It was a, it, my my wife's birthday, and she said I want to go to the space center. So it was a real busman's holiday for me. I took her out to the visitor center and we toured around, and uh, and she you know she was on the space program for twenty years. Your wonderful wife Melinda. Hello, yeah. Melinda. Glad that so you're she's, uh, with us today. So, so, and again, I, 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 I can always enjoy it out there. You know, yeah. go, go to Atlantis, to go out to the Apollo facility. Uh, it, it is, it is such a neat program to work on, and, and I've been in the middle of it for all this time. It, it's, it's wonderful. Great, you know, I, I can die tomorrow and be happy that I, that I had a good life. Well, uh, you are a national treasure. And, no. uh, yeah, well, that's what we call all of our. Workers here. Marty's Melinda a national calls, treasure Melinda too. calls me a space artifact. I think a that's space a, artifact. Yeah, that's a far, far right. more appropriate, I think. But we'll go along with that there. Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs job there. Anything we need to button up with our friends watching? No, nothing to button up, but I got a question that I was going to ask you, John, after the show, but I'll ask you now. We know weight was a problem on the Apollo program. The lunar module had many modifications to get the weight down. We also heard that the only purpose of the fins on the Saturn V was because uh, Werner von Braun said all rockets have fins. So if there's a weight problem, why did we put fins on a Saturn V? There Saturn V didn't have a weight problem oh. when it was designed. Okay, the, you know <laughs> that was the trouble. It was it was around long before the spacecraft, the lunar module, and the command service module were designed. But, you know, you get your weight allocation based on what's left. And I think that was the problem. You know, I, that's true. What Werner, you know, Werner wanted fins on his rockets. Everyone he ever launched had fins on it. And there were no aerodynamic need for them. That, that's what I was told. I, I've never really determined that. But it's, uh, yeah, it was, it was purely for aesthetics. Well, John Tribe, thank, thank you, you again, sir. Pleasure okay, to Mark. know you. Thank Pleasure. you for all you've done for the American Space Museum. I know Karen Conklin appreciates you and uh, from getting us the John Glenn button to, to, to what you do to, to help us every, every year. And this is another important part of it. So, folks, once again, thank you, Mr. John Tribe, a true American legend of our Apollo space program. And uh, we we're going to do... Two more programs this week, John. Thursday, we'll talk about the shuttles of September. Eleven of them flew in the month of September. And Friday, we've got a special program where we've got a guest, uh, uh, Ralph Palmer, who worked 30 years ago with Grumman on nuclear energy 
space rockets and that program got shelved and now we're talking about nuclear energy reactors again being needed to go to mars so that's the rest of our week here on behalf of our american space museum i want to thank you for watching stay curious i'm mark marquette saying i can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us